Thank you so much, Lisa. That was a wonderful presentation. And we do have some time for our webinar participants to interact and ask questions to you. So we do have one that came in that we'll start out with, Lisa. So when you speak of cultural safety, do you have additional information for caregivers for additional support? I attempt at best to support, but how am I to know if I'm being culturally an ally? That's a great question. And that's where I like the concept of humility as well. And if we think about cultural safety as being respectful engagement and working respectfully with your patients or clients, Part of that involves developing a strong relationship where they can trust you and when you can actually say, how is this going for you? How is there anything that I, you would like me to do in order to enhance your care experience? I mean, maybe not that language. That might not sound ideal for you, but figuring out in your own language how to ask a patient. Just ask a patient. I find the more I practice and the more I become comfortable with just being myself and being open to asking. And it's amazing if you ask with openness, and we would say like, you know, Nishabe with like an open heart and open mind and with humility, it's amazing what our patients will tell us. Like, actually, I was worried that I was not getting this test because I'm, you know, a First Nations person. And then we had a story about someone who felt that they were seeing a medical student because they were First Nations. And in fact, what we explained is that they weren't entitled and allowed to see a senior physician. They were getting a different level of care just because they're First Nations. And so when you open up these conversations and you're able to have trusting dialogue, then you can say, actually, that this is the way our healthcare, our specific organization works. We're a teaching hospital, and that means that we have medical students. If you're not comfortable seeing a medical student, please let me know so that you're having that dialogue. So it's hard to be prescriptive except to say, be open and be willing to change your practice and to change what you think is best because you need to work with the patient to help support their healing. Great. Thank you. Uh, So we have another question. How do you develop and implement cultural safety and anti-racism within health institutions? So there are some amazing materials that are now out there. And one of the organizations that I often tell people to turn to is the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health, because there's such a an incredible, we would say in the academic world, like clearinghouse for information and have all of these resources and webinars available. But one of the things that can become a metric in your organization is Having all of your providers or leadership team or others do the online, you know, the Sanyas online cultural safety training module, which is an eight to nine hour online facilitated module that shows, you know, the evaluations show that those who do that work have significant transformation in their knowledge. So that's an amazing resource that's available that we're really sharing. And there are other materials. So that's the piece around the cultural safety. Anti-racist practice, there are various organizations and experts. This is, it's, it's hard. As I said, the conversations around racism can be hard ones in an organization. And often it's helpful if you're able to, to have someone else from outside the organization, come in and start to guide you if possible. I mentioned the resource book, the anti-racist practice book by Elizabeth McGibbon and Josephine Otoa, and that's excellent. But if you really are wanting to open the ears and minds, I, I find that because it can, these are, can be hard conversations to have, bringing in experts, coaches, and others to help you can be useful. Great. And I'll just ask a question that sort of follows up on that, which is, would you recommend the use of focus groups, meetings, world cafes to build trust within an organization? Definitely. I think speaking to stakeholders around what form of engagement, but any of those are amazing ideas. Like our organization is open and committed. We don't know exactly what we should be doing. Please let us know. And 
ideally, when you're doing community engagement activities, you're actually going out to the organization as opposed to inviting them into your space. There may be a reason to invite people into the space as well. You know, mapping a patient's journey can be really helpful for an organization as well. You know, the journey of Métis or First Nations or Inuk patient as they go through the system and transition from a particular clinic to a particular, you know, on-reserve, off-reserve environment. What are all of the things that happen. So that can be another useful way to go. But definitely those activities that you mentioned can be helpful. Great. So this is a question that came in. Hi, Dr. Richardson. Thank you so much for your talk. As an Indigenous woman working in a leadership role in healthcare, I'm wondering if you have any advice for me how to mobilize senior leadership to take action and move away from tokenism and reconciliation. Thank you for your question, and I don't know what your experience is, but I want to acknowledge that this work is really hard. And so for those of us who are doing this work, we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves as well, because I find that we just need to acknowledge the emotional labor that's involved in doing this work. And that idea around convincing your senior team is a big one. And so my suggestion is figure out who is a real ally. Who is someone who really understands it? And or they may not yet quite have this background and understanding that you hope that they will one day have, but they have the openness and the humility to learn and the commitment to equity. And then working with them to help that person who's a non-Indigenous person identify and do that work with other allies so that you're not having to carry the burden of convincing every single person on the leadership team, but you have someone who's already in that role who then can work with, you can sort of coach and mentor and they can work with others within the leadership team. But this is where, again, coming back to relationships and knowing that there are a few allies who you can really rely on and turn to because being the one who's always calling out and speaking up becomes really difficult and also problematic because we also get labeled as disruptive and difficult. So having someone who's within, if they turn to you and said, can I speak up about this issue? And, you know, a true ally would not speak for you, but either give you space to speak or ask you what they can do to help you, then they can help do that work. And I have a couple of examples of people. I work with people at both the faculty level and at the hospital level who do that work with me. Thank you. Do you have any suggestions for wise practices for supporting two-spirit people in healthcare? Thank you so much for that question, and it's so important, and I realized as I was speaking about the role of women, I often speak about the role of two-spirit peoples in our communities, and this comes back to thinking about intersectionality and recognizing that, you know, there are layers of our identities, and being two-spirit adds yet another layer to being structurally marginalized within a mainstream organization. So do I have any wise practice suggestions? I think it's the same idea around the community engagement and relationship building. So here in Toronto, we have organizations that are really committed to supporting two-spirit people. And so having them guide us, and they've been integral at one of the women's college where I work in working with our team around some of our programming there, particularly because we are a a center that's committed to health for the LGBTQ2S community. So engaging them in the same way, using those wise practices. So going and meeting people in communities, doing the, you know, this, what, what do you need in a space in order to feel supported and welcome and valued? That's not a most the clearest answer. Sorry about that, but I just, you know, going to be humble here and say I think there's a lot of work to do still for two spirit inclusion. Okay, there was a comment related to veterans, Indigenous veterans, and the issues around trauma. And the question is, how should we best define trauma? Okay, so if you go to the Trauma Toolkit, that is a, is a website, and they have some clear definitions around trauma. And I mean, 
to be biomedical about it. There are some definitions like someone, you know, it's an experience where you fear for your life or you fear for the life of another or not just your life, but your well-being. But that's a biomedical definition. And I think about trauma as being broader than that, because that often implies, you know, a physical threat. But thinking about trauma as possibly an emotional threat, or elders would say even, you know, a threat to your spirituality or to your identity as something that could be a traumatic experience as well. And I'm not sure if there was a specific reference to veterans, but certainly we know major, major trauma amongst veterans. I talked about the Holocaust survivors and historical trauma and intergenerational trauma, but another group where there has been a lot of work around the experience of trauma has been people who have been in the military and veterans because of the experiences of being in a war environment and the effects that that can have. So definitely a really important consideration. Thank you for bringing that up. Great. Do you have any wise practices, uh, suggestions for working with women or mothers who are at risk of their baby being apprehended by child welfare in hospitals? So specifically, that's not an area where I am specifically working, but there are numerous programs that are doing that. And I can offer some suggestions later with resources and people who are doing that. There are a couple of examples here that I know of, and there are others. I mean, I think that acknowledging that this is, first of all, some of our provinces still have birth alerts. So we've got some policy work to do here around ending birth alerts, like BC just ended them so that child welfare is still involved. So is it a safe place? It's, you know, not necessarily safe in every organization yet or every in every jurisdiction yet for our women to be having babies, particularly if they're still doing the birth alert thing. So first of all, what's going on in your jurisdiction, wherever you are? And then secondly, you know, if there's still things happening, like the birth alerts, advocating around that as much as you can, uh, lobbying or supporting people who try to change that. And then working with moms, once you know that you don't have to worry about baby being taken away because of these alerts or whatever, then working with moms to say, how can we make this a better journey for you? And that's where the mapping of the patient's journey could be really helpful for you to work with a couple of different clients and sort of walk through their experience before or after birth, whenever they're able to do that, when they feel ready to do that and think about what were the points in their journey that were good ones and what were the trigger points or difficult points and how can we change the organization to address those. So the community engagement again. Okay, Lisa, we have about five minutes left. I'm going to ask one last question, then I'll wrap up the webinar. So the question is, I'm wondering if you have any tips to support building the resilience of people. The work on cultural safety and humility for people accessing health care is making some good impacts, but our people are still facing the systemic racism in ER, doctor's offices, pharmacies. How do we empower them with building resilience to not avoid accessing health services? Yeah, so this is one of the reasons I've become, I mean, I my career started as a clinician teacher, right? I've been doing a lot of teaching on the front line so that our providers are safe. But as I include that slide from Lawrence Kiermaier, like we're still functioning in an environment that is, you know, a colonial institution. And so this is where it's really helpful to have advocates or patient navigators. Ultimately, we want more Indigenous providers. <laughs> That's part of my goal. And we want, you know, institutions that have gone through a lot of this transformation to become better places because they have Indigenous boards and governance circles and Indigenous peoples working throughout the organization or in the pharmacy or wherever. But until we get there, people need to know that we all have the right to high quality care. And this is actually a part of the movement around high quality care. So quality and patient safety is a language and sort of approach that's really embedded now across our organization. So how can you leverage whatever those processes are in your institution? So speaking to the ombudsperson, patient relations, patient complaints is really 
important, but you need to recognize that that can be a tough journey because then you're exposed and you're worried about your care. So having an advocate and that advocate might be someone who's, you know, an Indigenous provider or a navigator, or it might be someone from your local Indigenous organization who can be with you and speak up and speak out. I think that's important. I mean, it's always a tough call. Like you you know that you're getting a different level of care. I speak as a white passing person. The, the kind of care I get is totally different. So I'm not speaking about my own experiences, but of those of others. And that is, you know, do I like disclose my identity? Do I not? Do I pretend to pass as someone from a different culture? Do I speak up about this racism? Those are calls you have to make in the moment. But if you have someone there who's got the experience around how to navigate the system, it's really helpful. So leveraging those people and leveraging that in your, that's why having navigators in your organization is really powerful. Because then if there's a complaint, it doesn't have to come from you. It can come from the navigator and they don't have to say who it's come from. They can say, you know, I've worked with this person, this person, and worked with a group of Indigenous people that I've noticed there's a trend here. They're not able to smudge. Or when you try to smudge here, then they're told that, you know, they need to wait seven two hours and that's just not appropriate. So having that level of distance between you and being able to make the complaint is helpful. And it may be like someone from band council who you can turn to, but having a third party, I would recommend. Thank you so much, Lisa. We did get uh, quite a few other questions that we haven't been able to uh, get to within this period, but I just wanted to extend my thanks for answering the questions that we did get to you. Just very quickly, the Collaborating Center does have a newly updated Access to Health Services fact sheet that can be accessed on our website. As well, we have additional webinars that speak to some of the issues that we've talked about today. But in closing, I just want to say on behalf of the National Collaborating Center for Indigenous Health, I want to extend my most sincere and warmest appreciation to you, Lisa, for sharing your knowledge and expertise on the webinar today. I feel like we are all the wiser for having listened to your presentation. Also, I'd like to thank everybody who participated on the webinar, and we hope that you join us in the future for other learning opportunities. So thank you again, and have a great rest of the day to everyone.